I'm just as nervous as Sarah is, I think, even though I'm the one interviewing. <laughs> um, my name is Maya. I'm a communications officer here at the college in the president's office. Um, and I'm really excited to be here with Sarah today. Um, when I heard about this opportunity, I was incredibly stoked because I actually play competitive ringette and Sarah kind of toes the line between sport and media um, and working in media. Um, I'm also super interested in sport media. So I'm excited to talk to her today, um, as I'm sure many of you are. Um, so without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome our very special guest, Sarah Jenkins. It's so awkward standing to the side when everybody can still see you. So Sarah is a sports produ producer and social media content creator. Yes. Go follow her on TikTok, at Sarah Jenkins XO. I made that username in like, <laughs> like literally 10 years ago. It was I, the only one. Sarah Jenkins like is a very common name and I had to like keep the brand alive. Of course. Yeah. Gossip Girl was the inspiration. You had to add the XO. I feel like that was all the rage in the 2000s. Everybody had XO after yes. there. Yeah. Like I was like... <laughs> It's so cute and artsy now. Yeah. yeah. Now I'm like, oh, why don't I just take Sarah Jenkins? But it's fine. But it's okay. You've already built your brand on Sarah Jenkins. I have so. to own it now. <laughs> exactly. My friends actually for my birthday last year to tease me made a line of EXO merch with like oh my, my name goodness. on it. It was very cute, but I was like, really? this is kind of <laughs> cringe. I'm not like the weekend. Anyways. Mm. <laughs> so a little bit more about Sarah. Um, she is an experienced uh, television producer. Um, of some of the world's largest sporting events. So she's actually hosted, well, not hosted, but produced for Olympics, right? Correct. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, produces, like, as a production assistant running people copy the first oh, time. Don't be like, shy. The other three. The other three. <laughs> um, and now she also works as a TikTok creator, um, building a community across Canada and around the globe. So I'm very excited to be welcoming her here today. Please give Sarah a warm welcome. Thank you. So I think we'll just start by you telling us a bit about yourself. I think you just did it, but <laughs> keep going. I know there's more. <laughs> I know there is. Uh, I'm Sarah. So yes, I live a double life. I call it my Hannah Montana lifestyle, where some people know me as producer Sarah uh, that works in sports content by day, by night and day, I guess still. I vlog my daily life on TikTok. So I started doing that a couple of years ago. And then now it's morphed into this beautiful world where I get to do both full time not great for my sleep but mm -hmm. uh it's great in all other aspects so i get to do so many different things which is great because i'm someone that doesn't like doing the same thing every day mm -hmm. so it is awesome so i have like my little double life where i get to do both i've produced sports content uh for the past set more than that eight years now um with the cbc with yahoo sports sportsnet tsn you name a network or somewhere we've probably worked with them before and then uh yeah and then now in the past couple of years creating content with brands on TikTok and just for myself as well and do you find it tough to like juggle both of those absolutely yeah <laughs> um it's the truth like it's because when you start when I started doing TikTok vlogs it was when I was unemployed well I started doing it as a way to learn the app and mm -hmm. then COVID hit and obviously no sports happened so you didn't need a sports producer for anything so I just dove into TikTok because I was like, I need a reason to get up in the morning. So I decided to mandate myself three videos a day because mm -hmm. I'm a psychopath. And I was like, <laughs> I'm gonna make three videos a day and I'm just gonna see the growth. And I did that until I was employed again. And I was like, well, I have to keep three videos up. <laughs> so then I continued at that pace for about a year and a half. Now I'm more flexible with myself. Sometimes I'll do two. I post at least once every day though. So wow. yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely finding the balance. I'm lucky though that my content is just my life and people mm -hmm. are for some reason interested in that so I don't have to stress really but like if I was like I don't know like a beauty guru doing makeup I'd be like oh my god I need to like spend hours to do like a makeup look or something whereas this like if I don't have a video like I might just like sit at the airport and review whatever food I'm going to eat at the Ottawa airport mm -hmm. if there's any good things like let me know if there's good recommendations <laughs> so like it's nice because I can just do things like that like any part of my life I can talk yeah. about coffee I can talk about books I'm reading so that makes it a little bit more manageable because I do love being a producer by day. So it's mm -hmm. I don't want to like have to pick between the two. And why do you love being a producer? Like what drew you to sports media? I always want to work in media. Yeah. Um, back in the day of like peak much music, I was like lining up outside of much music to try and see like One Direction and stuff um, back in the live show days. But so I wanted I thought I wanted to work on much music I was like I want to be a VJ mm -hmm. I want to interview Justin Bieber like that's what I want to do and then they stopped doing those live shows and at the same time um it's 
coincided with like my hockey career coming to an end mm -hmm. and the sport media program at the university formerly known as Ryerson popped up and my dad was actually the one that pushed me to apply to it because he's like you could be part of a first graduating class that's really cool mm -hmm. so I did it and I got in and ended up being part of this like cohort of we call ourselves guinea pigs because being part of a first like class of a program you do a lot of test runs but it also gave me a lot more opportunities so I just saw the opportunities in sport media and never really looked back and I always wanted mm -hmm. to go to an Olympics I haven't done it yet but I wanted to work on the Olympics and that program gave me the capacity to do it and I guess you spoke to this a bit already, but tell us a bit more about your career journey, you know, from finishing school now to being a producer yes. um, and content creator. Yes. Maybe you can tell us a bit Making about that. Making all the things. Yeah. So I started working while in school because I'm a keener. Um, <laughs> also, but like I, the nice thing about going to school in Toronto was a lot of my instructors were in the industry. So if you were good in school and a keener, then they would give you opportunities. So my first job, I was actually telling Maya this earlier when we were having coffee. It was a very humble beginnings. My first job at CBC was airport pickup. I didn't know it was airport pickup. I showed up being like, oh, you're working the conference. So I like wore like little heels, like this type of thing. And like a little, little like pantsuit situation. I bought a dynamite and I was like, oh my God, my first big girl job. And I show up there like, great, here, get on the bus. You're going to the airport and you're gonna stand there for 14 hours directing people that get off flights. Like here's the flight schedule and you're gonna send them downtown on the train. And I'm in these like heels. And I was like, I can't change now. So I get sent to the airport. And I'm like running around Pearson. And that was like a nightmare. 14, a nightmare. 14 hours, like I'm grabbing like Clara Hughes from like her flight. And like, here, Clara, here's your ticket for the, <laughs> for, like, for the train. Oh. And then like I was losing people because I was at Terminal 3. And oh my God, they were at Terminal 1. And they changed, like just like disastrous. But I was like started as a production assistant in my humble beginnings. Worked my way up, worked two Olympic Games with CBC while I was at university and then um, I left because I had the opportunity to become a producer at Yahoo Sports so I was the first woman hired on their team there was only oh. a team of like eight people mm -hmm. and at its core I always wanted to make digital content but in school I went to radio and television school so like they didn't really get that when I was like I want to make YouTube videos for a living they're like huh and so you can make a career yeah that. <laughs> exactly and so I want to do that and Yahoo gave me the opportunity to okay. I, it was strictly digital content and I'd Get to host a little bit i'd get to make podcasts and mm -hmm. video content so many different types so i left cbc for that and i went full-time at yahoo i covered the leafs i was in the dressing room it was really cool very bro -y, but very cool <laughs> um i got to travel i got to like go to the stanley cup finals and all these really cool events i got to cover the raptors playoff run and when they won the championship um and then on a random wednesday in december they cut half our team so got laid off, like the cliche of the person with the box and like all of their belongings in it. That was, was you. Me, was me. <laughs> the funniest part though was like, I was one of the last people to get called in. So like we knew what was happening. Mm -hmm. And I walk into the room and the first thing goes, do I get to keep my phone? And they're like, uh, if you want to, I go, okay, cool. I'll have my lawyer talk to you. I didn't have a lawyer. And I just walk out. I'm like, I'll have my lawyer talk to you. I guess I had like, by that point, seen But happened. you do, your partner's a lawyer. Now. Now, now you have is. a lawyer. He wasn't a lawyer at the time, though. Yeah. So it would have been useless. It was a big bluff. So anyways, I got laid off and was like, what do I do with my life? Went back to the CBC, which was actually like great because by that point I had producer experience. So if I had actually stayed at CBC, I probably wouldn't have been at the level that I am now because sometimes you have to leave a place to like come back and then mm -hmm. come up at a higher level. So I went and gained experience, then came back as a mm -hmm. producer and that's where I was producing television weekly. And then we opened a digital content studio and I made a deck and pitched my job. And that's how I have the job that I have now. Very cool. And do you have any advice um, for anyone who's looking to enter sports media or maybe even switch careers, change fields? Yeah, um, for sports media specifically, um, thinking you have to be a big sports fan is a lie. You don't. Mm -hmm. I am a sports fan, but like, do I know all the stats and this and that? Absolutely not. That's what other people are there for. That's what commentators mm -hmm. are there for. That's whatever. But do I know content? Yes. Yeah. So I'd say that's a big misconception is I think it deters a lot of people, especially young women away. Like, I wouldn't knew very niche sports. I worked for Canoe Kayak Canada, which shout out Algonquin. I used to live in that residence in the summertime, <laughs> actually, back in the day um, between there and Niagara. So I used to work with like Canoe Kayak Canada. Canoe and Kayak is a very like niche sport. And then I played hockey, so I obviously knew hockey, but I didn't know like anything about the NFL or this mm -hmm. or that or basketball. I was producing a weekly basketball podcast with Danny Green on the Raptors. 
didn't know anything about the MBA. I learned though. As you got I was really going. into the MBA. <laughs> I did. I, I had to, but you learn as you're going. So I think a big misconception is people think you have to be like a mm -hmm. diehard sports fan. I actually think it makes you a better employee and content producer if you have a different outside perspective, especially coming to a sport you don't know. Um, I'd say the biggest piece of advice I'd give though is nowadays they're looking for people that are just like doers that are willing to create their own content on their own. Mm -hmm. Like the fact that with your phone, you can create like high quality video content now. Like I didn't have that when I was starting out, I could have made YouTube videos, but it wasn't the same as like TikTok or reels or any of that. Mm -hmm. So even if nobody, I would say like, it used to be back in the day, go make a blog or make a website, even if no one's reading it or watching it, it doesn't matter. Cause you're, when I'm hiring now, I'm still looking at people that are like doers and like, can think of ideas and just like want to make cool stuff. Mm -hmm. Cause it doesn't matter if no one's seeing it, that will still get you I don't know, notice it's more of like a visual resume as opposed to just like what's written. Portfolio pieces. For sure, yeah. for sure, which I don't think actually is a normal concept in sports media specifically, unless mm -hmm. you're like a cinematographer or something, but if you're a social media manager and you just wanna show like graphics or pages you've managed or whatever, like put that all in one place so that you can send that along when you're applying for jobs or meeting with people and all of that stuff. And zooming out of the sports space a little bit, um, do you have any recommendations for um new grads in post-grad life yes <laughs> i thought i was ahead of the game and then like i said on a random wednesday in december i lost my job and was like oh my god what do i do i think it really showed that showed me that like everyone's paths are so different and everyone's timelines are so different whether you're going back to school or whether like back, going back to school is actually something i always thought i would do but i just haven't done it yet um i don't i think you get so caught up in like the mindset of like school, job, this, mm -hmm. that, duh. And then I don't think that's the mentality anymore. I think more people are taking time to travel or taking time to like, do you know what? I wanna go be an au pair in New Zealand for like a year, why not, right? Cause like, even now I find myself going like, how do I move to London for a year? Like, how do I just do that? Which I would have loved to do after school, right? I actually missed out on a lot of opportunities like with my friends and stuff when I just went right from, I literally walked out of my last university class and walked into my first day and my full-time job, which at the time felt like, oh, I'm doing great, I'm so far ahead. But then I ended up like, just like giving so much to a company that gave nothing back to me anyways. Mm. So it really changed my mindset on um, not allowing myself to be di like dictated by my job. I used to be known like in sports media as Sarah from Yahoo. That was like who I was, or like Sarah who is a producer, a video producer. But now I just try to be like, it sounds so cliche, but just like Sarah, you know what I mean? Like, I don't want people to only associate me with what my position is. And I think new grads are really like guilty of that. Even in school, like everyone always asks like, what are you studying? And so much of your identity is tied to what you do mm -hmm. and like what you're studying or any of that. And I think the more you step away from that mentality, one, the less stressed you'll be, the happier you'll be. And the more opportunities will just come when you allow yourself to not look at the traditional route. And do you think being a content creator on TikTok has helped you move away from that a bit? Absolutely. And, you know, yeah, absolutely. create a new label for yourself. Yeah, well, even like on TikTok, people always say like, find your niche. Yeah. I've never, if any of you follow me, I've never had a niche. Mm -hmm. One day I decided I like reading and then now I make content about books. <laughs> One day I decide I'm gonna, like a few, last year I was like, I'm gonna go gluten-free and make gluten-free content. That lasted like two weeks. And then people are like, where's the gluten-free content? I'm like, oh, I don't do that anymore. You know what I mean? Like it's because it's just about my life. Yeah. I like don't follow a niche. I guess my mm. niche is vlogs, but like that's not really a niche. That's a style of content. That's a way that you make it. And yeah, so TikTok really helped me with that because I've never been Sarah, the girl that does this, mm -hmm. Sarah, the girl that does that. It's some people will go, oh, I follow you for your book reviews or, oh, I follow you because you work in sports media and I watched your Olympic content or something. So it's nice because it's given me the outlet to be able to show all sides of myself as opposed to just like sports media bro, Sarah, who she, I don't like her all the time. So, <laughs> so you have different uh, characters. Yes, I'm a Gemini. Yeah. I have different characters. <laughs> and um, to follow that up, I guess, do you think that authenticity helps you, uh, you know, succeed in being a content creator? Do you think, you know, the fact that you're authentic to yourself and, you know, it's always changing and ebbing and flowing, do you think that helps you be a more successful content creator? I'd say so. Yeah. I think it's helped um, being a more consistent content creator. Mm -hmm. So if you guys follow people on TikTok, you'll see a couple of years ago, there was a trend where like someone would make a video and they'd gain like 500,000 followers overnight but it was only because that one specific type of content. So it, then if you weren't making that specific type of content, people would be like, 
what's this? This is the one I followed you for. Like the story I always yeah. tell is a friend of mine found her old like iPod from like, I don't know, grade six or something. And she was trying to unlock it. She gained 700,000 followers in 48 hours because everyone wanted to see her, what was on the iPod. But then when she stopped making those videos, people were like, you're a fraud. We don't want this anymore. And then they like, they just didn't engage with her content. Now she gets like 200 views on a video with 700,000 followers. So for me, I've always had slow and consistent growth, mm -hmm. which I think I like I, I value a lot more because like the, the community that follows me knows me and I whenever talking to creators people want to start out like don't aim for viral success like mm -hmm. aim for doing things that are slow and consistent that people will know you for then they get to know you better like I don't have millions of followers but I still get higher engagement than some of my friends that do just due to the fact that like the community that does engage with me is highly engaged which mm -hmm. I I think I appreciate a lot more grew more like a youtube audience rather than a traditional tiktok audience which i really appreciate and a bit on the subject of growth um and we talked about this already i think before and i know that one of the things is you're always busy sarah is always busy is what i've learned from talking to her we've been talking for like seven hours already yeah <laughs> <Not> actually <laughs> she's like always four. busy um but what do you think has changed the most in your life since growing uh, a social media following I saw this question before and I've had to think about it I, like the whole plan right here. I'm like, what has changed the most? A lot has changed. Mm -hmm. um, but like a cliche, nothing's changed. So a lot's changed in the sense of like, I don't know, like people will like stop me on the street and go, you're that girl from TikTok <laughs> or they go, where do I know you from? Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know, man. Like, I, and then you don't want to be the one that's like, it's from TikTok because then it makes you like <laughs> kind of look like a jerk. Um, so that's changed. I'd say my relationship with work has changed a lot mm -hmm. with TikTok uh, because I do have this avenue where I can truly be myself. That's changed a lot, which has been really great. Um, I think me looking to, I was talking about like non-traditional like ways after you like graduate and stuff. Yeah. I think the opportunity for me to have a more non-traditional career is more appealing to me now because of it. And that mindset has changed a lot. Like, I think I can see my life going into very different paths. It's either like stay at a corporate job, go to this one after two years, go to this next job after two years. It's like just yeah. going up like that or like this like weird world where you can make whatever you want. Make and your own job. Make your own job. So like mm -hmm. that's changed. My, my, my mindset around work has changed a lot, I think, because of it too. Mm -hmm. So you would say maybe you're more free about the yeah. approach you take to work? Well, it's like, yes, I'm more free in the sense of like my approach to take to work, but less free in the sense of like, I'm very aware of everything I put on the internet now and like very aware that like I do have eyeballs on me. I do have an audience and like people do take what I say with a great, like they do hold it highly a lot mm -hmm. of time and I have to hold myself accountable when it comes to that. So that's, that's something that's changed. I'm constantly thinking about content that way and making sure that I'm being the best version of myself. Not that it's inauthentic, but it's like, you know, just yeah. choosing what to post and when not to post or when I'm really hot headed, if I get like a, a mean comment, I <laughs> have to give myself like 24 hours before I reply to it mm -hmm. or else I'll just like snap and be like really rude on the reply. So I've learned to like change that a little bit because I used to be really hot headed when I'd reply to mean comments. And then you have to remember like people are reading like comments in like a yeah. different tone than what you're doing. So that's mm -hmm. all changed a lot. So you've talked a lot about authenticity, and I would say in talking with you, you're a very authentic human. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> um, but I guess I'm wondering, you know, sometimes it can be difficult for creators uh, to build a brand when they have so many hands in different pots, so many different niches and so many different things they talk about and enjoy and like, mm -hmm. uh, which is just normal for being a human, yes. but we forget that. Yes. <laughs> um, so what would you recommend uh, for people looking to build their own brand? Um, you know, it can, it can be difficult to be authentic and to not have a niche, but what would you recommend that they do? Um, I'd find a, say find a formula that works for you to be your most authentic self, because mm -hmm. for some people that might not be TikTok, like some people put a video, like start recording a video mm -hmm. and like they freeze up and they start like I have a friend of mine that like starts recording a video and like sounds like a different human being when they start speaking and I was like what is this they don't even realize they're doing it they just like start putting on this like elaborate voice and so I think being authentic also depends on like the platform you're on right so it might not be mm -hmm. that way for everyone I know some people thrive best just like talking on their Instagram stories and like that way some people thrive best more in a podcast setting some people thrive best in YouTube where it's longer form content. And I thrived in voiceover because I could, as a producer, I could like craft the story how I wanted to, and I could like redo my voiceovers. Mm -hmm. And 
I could talk as fast as I wanted to. <laughs> so I could, I, that's where I thrived and that's where I was able to show my most authentic self. So I think some people think, they might watch my videos and go, oh, in order to be authentic, I have to do exactly what Sarah's doing, which is in, inherently is inauthentic if you are doing exactly what somebody else is doing. So I think it's just about finding the space in which you feel most like yourself, because it's going to be a little bit different for everyone. My, my friend Naomi, she's a TikTok content creator as well, and she's an authentic content creator, but she scripts all of her stuff because that's how mm -hmm. she feels the most comfortable and feels like she can be her best self is through scripting. Whereas I don't script anything, whereas sometimes I should script stuff and I do get feedback that I should script more, <laughs> but I just don't because I just start talking. And so I, I just think it being authentic inherently comes from like wherever you feel the most like yourself in a space. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think that necessarily means like one type of content or one platform as an example. And do you think that can change over time? Yes, do you, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think people- Has it for you? Yeah, a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think I've figured out which types of videos allow me to. I catch myself on vlogs all the time or because I post so many a day, like in the routine of it, that I'm like, okay, you're saying the same thing or you're just doing it because it's easy or like you're, you know, and I try to catch myself and not allow myself to do that. So mm -hmm. that's when I'll like change up the format or like maybe I'll just do a walk and talk where I'll just talk to my camera because that just, I need a refresh almost um, because it can become like a routine very easily and I've never wanted it to feel that way even though sometimes like everything at a certain point even if you like it becomes a job and so mm -hmm. sometimes you're like oh okay I have to do this like yeah. and I really try not to allow myself to but it, I'm human it obviously happens and I have a burning question wow <laughs> um is it where's so, Nolan because that's the comment I get the most no. TikTok videos. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. um I'm curious do you ever feel like awkward or uncomfortable when you're filming content or doing content like in a in a public space. Okay, no, because let me show you guys what I do. Okay, so <laughs> all my friends know I I film in the app. Is it living on the edge a little bit? Absolutely, because <laughs> do my videos get deleted a lot? Absolutely. But as you can see, all these little tiny clips. So okay, so if I was shooting this right now, I would go like this. Oh. That's it. That's all I do. Oh. Yeah. So my friends like. But what if you have to talk? But I do my voiceover after. If I have to talk, oh. but I don't do that in public. I okay. refuse. Okay. The idea of having a vlog camera in public <laughs> would have been like when I, I have some YouTube friends and they bring out a vlog camera in public oh. and I'm like, what are you doing? Like, you look like a tourist. Oh. And so I don't do that. My friends are hilarious because they now like will watch the videos just to like see themselves in it. And they'll be like, I didn't even realize you were filming. Like, I'm so sneaky. Mm. I try to be sneaky at least. My friend Haley now has a series where she when we go on trips together, she goes behind the scenes of the vlog and she has this one clip. It's hilarious. I'm going up an escalator and you can see like the TikTok screen on my thing and she's like zooms in. It's like always ready. <laughs> so it's just like I just shoot little clips because that way it feels like I can still live in the moment. Like I put my phone down. I'll shoot my clips. I go mm -hmm. phone eats first. I'll show the food, put it down and then I don't have to touch it again. Mm -hmm. So but shooting like Instagram, I hate Instagram shooting Instagram, like I photo dump culture has made me like it more, but like the idea of posing for an Instagram photo mortifies me. And that like, I'm going on a trip this weekend with a bunch of influencers to Nashville and we're gonna have to do a lot of that. And I'm very scared for it because like, that's the part where I'm do like, any oh of my you have ads to put up while you're away? No. Okay. No, <laughs> but like, I just, that part freaks me out. Cause yeah. that's not what I grew up doing. Like I only took photos when I went on trips or something. Mm -hmm. So now that part's weird for me, but shooting actual TikTok content in person is easy it's peasy easy. for me just because I have, again, talking about being authentic, I figured out a formula that allows me to be authentic and still be in the moment mm -hmm. and can still experience things and enjoy things while shooting content. Mm -hmm. So I get the best of both worlds. Yeah, you do. And it sounds like this bleeds into our next question a bit. So how do you manage your personal, professional and social media life? And make them all so successful. How do you do okay, that? Okay, so first of all, um, manage is like a, it's, it depends on the day. Um, some days I manage better than others. Yeah. Um, I do have help. I do not do it all by myself. Mm -hmm. About a year ago, I brought on a manager to take on any TikTok brand deals, scheduling, making sure I showed up to this on time, that type of stuff, like making sure I know it's my calendar. Like I, and I'm so grateful for him because he's like, Jacob's become like a good friend of he's mine great. as well. Shout out Jacob, we love Jacob. Um, and so that's really helped. I, li I literally could not do it without him. Um, 
I could not keep my full time job. Yeah. It would just be impossible. There's so many emails. There's so many emails. I know. I don't even. I know I, you used to work in the space when you yeah. have a brand deal. So many. <laughs> I know people are like, oh, they just shoot a video, mm -hmm. like 140 emails back and forth in a thread. Yeah. 140 for yeah. like a 30 second video. Mm -hmm. And I thank God don't and have that to, contract is like 10 pages. I long. know. Thank God I'm dating a lawyer. Like I just like you can't it, I just would never. So I have a lot of people in my corner, so I'd never be able to do it alone. Yeah. Um, but I think my my content again allows myself to have more flexibility with it. But I don't know. I've just always been a busy person. It's funny in the pan. I got a comment a few weeks ago that was like, I miss your pandemic vlogs when you would like just, you know, wake up and make a coffee. And I was like, we were in a lockdown. Like I literally couldn't do anything else. And I'm not a home, I'm not a homebody. Like when I watch my videos, I'm not a homebody. Like someone else was like, you make me anxious because you're always out and about. But it's just like, I don't, I don't feel comfortable like that. I've mm -hmm. always liked doing a lot of things. I get FOMO very easily. I like being busy. Um, I have my like one night a week. I always dedicate to myself just to like not talk to anybody and like relax. But the reason I'm I can surprised do by that. Yeah, I, I give my one, and even then it's like I'm shooting yeah, content, so yeah, I'm still exactly. like working. But I, I don't know. I've just always been. It takes like a certain personality. Yeah. So I don't think it's like it's fair to look and go like, oh, like she's doing so much. Like it just might literally not be your personality type. And mm -hmm. so I've always been this way. Like my friend made a comment. I was like, oh, I would have loved to live alone at one point. He goes, you would have somebody over every night of the week. Like you could not live alone, which is true because I'm as you can tell chatty. So I think. I think it's hard to like when people can that's why I hate when people compare themselves to me and go I don't do anything or I don't feel successful or whatever mm -hmm. it's just like it's literally my brain is just wired like I've always been this way I always had hockey to this to that mm -hmm. so it's but I do have a team of people I could not do it all by myself or else yeah. I literally would go insane yeah and I think we were talking about this earlier but finding the field that works for you you know yes. that fits your personality yes yeah. yeah and I think that's like I love talking to people. I love meeting new people. I love doing different things, mm -hmm. which is why like the two jobs that I do have is perfect for me. Um, and like, again, it, it might not be for everyone. Like mm -hmm. some people just like are inherently introverts. So like mm -hmm. I'm an extrovert. I'm fueled by like other people and what they're saying. So like, that's why it works for me, I guess. And mm -hmm. so that's why it's like comparison is the thief of joy. Don't compare yourself because you don't know, like people are just literally wired differently. Mm -hmm. And when you do unwind, how do you unwind? I read. Yeah. Actually, that was an, I only really started reading and that sounds, that sounds dumb. I've been <laughs> reading my whole life, but I mean, like, I, I only, only started, I only learned read. how to read last year. <laughs> no, I started like reading like as a hobby yeah. last year because I was on my phone so much. Sorry, I'm probably ruining the shot by having my phone in it. Um, my phone's here too. It's okay. The producer in me is like my eyes yeah. twitching. Um, the papers are like hanging. Yeah. Like, oh, no. <laughs> the continuity here is all yeah. up. I, but I would be on my phone all the time because work was on my phone, TikTok was on my phone. I'd go on the comments and just like, oh, I have to reply to all these. I have to mm -hmm. reply to every single person. So reading is the only time that I like, I'm not looking at a screen. Mm -hmm. And so I can throw my phone across the room. I put it on Do Not Disturb. And then that's how I found out that Taylor Swift dropped an album two hours later than everyone else. And everyone <gasps> thought I was dead. Like literally thought I was dead. I'm like, I was just reading. I was really into the love I pop. But it was, it was a sequel or something. But I, yeah, so I started reading as a way to get away. And just like mentally like block at that time mm -hmm. same with having baths i can't take my phone in the bathtub i don't trust myself mm -hmm. so those are like two things i do at least once a week like i read a book and i take mm -hmm. a bath so that i get off the cellular device yeah it's hard to do it is it's really tough and then even then like am i still filming it like kind of yeah but, but it's it doesn't feel like it I don't know. You're filming yourself in the bath? No, like <laughs> what I do, this is behind the scenes. I'll always film the bath first. I obviously don't film in the yeah, bath. Of course. I'll film the bathtub first and then I'll go throw my phone in my bed so I don't do it. Good. So then it's like, but I'll film all the clips before I even get in the tub and be like, oh, I took a bath. And then, anyways, so that's, <laughs> and you know what I mean? Like I just, but I do film yes. it. Like yeah, I yeah, just, yeah. it's still, of course. it's still content. Because you're vlogging. I'm vlogging. Yeah. And like, I still enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I will stop if I don't enjoy it anymore. I'm good with boundaries. I will stop yeah. if I don't enjoy it, but I still enjoy it for now. Mm -hmm. So that's why I like doing it. And do you perceive yourself continuing to enjoy it? Like, are you? Yeah. 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 I, I mean, it's been two, two, over two years now and yeah. I still enjoy doing it. I enjoy the challenge of it because I think um, playing around with new formulas or new formats mm -hmm. or like, I've been practicing shooting out of the app. Wow, yeah. shocking, Sarah. It's what everybody else does. <laughs> and so I've been trying like different formulas with that mm -hmm. as well. And like, I've always loved editing. 
Um, that was my first like real job when I worked at Yahoo. A lot of it was editing heavy, mm -hmm. so I still enjoy it. Um, do I post as much anymore? No, because now I'm like really trying to think of quality over quantity. Mm -hmm. Like I used to feel like I had to post three videos a day. That was my own thing I sent myself. Mm -hmm. Now I'm like allowing myself more flexibility there. But yeah, I'll do it for a while. I don't know. It's really hard to picture being like 45 years old and still vlogging like in another 20 years from now. Like, I don't know. That would be like literally thousands upon thousands of videos. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to touch on that, like the future of what your career looks like. Do you have any big goals for the future? Many career goals. goals. I have too many. Yeah. I want to make a movie. I want to own a mm -hmm. production company. I at one point wanted to write a book, but I think I want to write a screenplay instead. <laughs> That's the other thing. Um, I'm starting a podcast. Oh, I'm yes. This is like a practice run for me, actually. Yeah, this is good. Um, yeah, I, I, I've always wanted to do like a million different things. So, mm -hmm. um, those are kind of like you'd the be next a great steps. podcast host. Thank you. Yeah, you would definitely. I definitely listen to you. Oh my gosh. For sure. Well, it's coming out in like a self promo time. <laughs> no, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm working. I'm working on it right now. So I'm actually going to meet my cool. designer for coffee after oh, this. Yeah, awesome. I worked out two birds one stone. But great. yeah, so I, I don't know. I've always wanted to do 90 million things. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe tomorrow I'll want to like I don't know change career paths again. But mm -hmm. I think now that I've seen that you can just like change your path and whatever, I allow myself the space to want to do a million things. And I still yeah. want to go to an Olympics. That's still like a big one. And mm -hmm. Paris is going to be cool. So hopefully I get to go to that. Yeah, that'd be fun. Wee oui, wee. Oui. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that was like really bad. Most of you are probably bilingual and you're like, oh, she said that's so wrong. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to the audience um, for questions. So if anybody has any questions, uh, Lauren's just over there in the corner and she can come bring you the mic, okay? Any questions? <laughs> yes, there's Hi. one. Hello. Hi. Uh, so you said you wanted to make a movie. What? What kind of movie would you make? A rom-com. Yeah. Okay. Obviously. <laughs> Maybe not obvious to people that don't know me. All I do is read romance novels and I critique them in my head relentlessly when I'm reading them. And half the time, again, I sometimes have a, it's the Gemini in me, I sometimes have a God complex. And I'm reading them like, I can write a better book than this. <laughs> have I ever sat down to write a book? No, but my brain goes, you can write a better book than this, which is not true. I could not, but I, I love rom-coms. I don't think they make rom-coms, they make them for like either like teenagers, yeah. or like they're the really like old ones mm. that are really outdated and usually like kind of sexist and kind of racist mm. so i'm like i don't really want to like watch those so i want to like make a space where there'd be a really cool rom-com mm -hmm. i don't know that's i watched a really good rom-com at tiff and it got me really back into the idea of making one um it's called what's love got to do with it it comes out in january highly recommend seeing it and so that's i think what i'd want to i'm just like a big proponent and like you should make stuff that you would also want to consume and like like that's I approach that with TikTok with everything it's the same with like reading like I don't think I have to in order to be someone that like reads as a hobby I don't have to like read like I don't know all of these memoirs or all of these like really intense like I don't know I don't need to read Shakespeare you know no. or like pretentious novels no. like I I just love reading rom-coms and so I want to like make one as a movie one day mm -hmm. that's a good hopefully <laughs> we'll see any other questions? <laughs> you have to do the movie. I know. Now that you've spoken into the again, universe. I've have I ever been on a movie set? No, <laughs> but I'll go. Okay, doesn't matter. Sure. <laughs> I go to TIFF once, and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna have a movie at TIFF. Like, I don't know. It's okay. I get it, it works apparently. It worked to get me to see Taylor Swift a couple weeks ago, so it happened. Ooh. Yeah. Taylor Swift inspired me to make a movie. Anyways, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, thank you so much for coming out and sharing your experience and your story. Um, I just wanted to ask, especially because uh, sharing a lot of your personal life online, um, how do you make sure, like, as security-wise and, like, for your own safety, how do you make sure that's protected? Because I always kind of got worried about the idea of, like, posting stuff too much where it shows, like, what city I could be from or something, because you never mm -hmm. know with people online, I guess. And, like, what's, what do you have any advice for that type? Yeah, so I definitely have had to get better at it because it's really easy when you start to be like, oh, it's only like 10,000 followers. Mm -hmm. But then like one day it's 20,000 and then 30. And then you're like, luckily my parents are very involved. The day I made a Twitter account, Sarah Jenkins XO, my father made a Twitter account and mm -hmm. said, 
I'm going to see everything you post. Employers will see that one day. Because yeah. my dad's been like security detail since I was 14 <laughs> yeah, years old. Like kind of like moderating your space. hundred <laughs> percent. And so like my sister was the same way. Like I remember an early vlog. I like in one clip didn't pay attention. I accidentally posted our unit number. She goes, you need to take that down right now. And I didn't even realize. Yeah. And so like take it down, whatever. Whereas like in hindsight at the time, I had like no followers, like literally like zero. But like she was right. Like you don't, it's really easy to, um, forget that they're real people on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, so when I moved, I was careful about it. I, when I meet people in person that like live in my area that will be like, oh, I knew you lived in this area. I'll go, but did you figure out the building? They're like, no, I couldn't figure out the building. I'm like, that's all I care about. That's fine. <laughs> and so like at a certain degree, I do understand like people, it's the same as when I watch a YouTuber like, and I know they're from Toronto and I recognize the areas they're from. One thing that I've started to do is I used to post Instagram stories in the moment. I don't do that anymore. I'll always post them like, after I've left mm, the location, yeah. with the exception of doing it here, I just realized I did it. But anyways, I'm getting better at it. <laughs> I'm getting better. But people knew I was going to be the here. followers were They knew I was going to be to here, Ottawa. So. <laughs> but so I, yeah, it's something I've had to be more top of mind of. Um, and it's mostly other people bring it to my attention because you just don't think about it right, sometimes. Yeah, you're so busy, you're making content yourself, right? And you're just For like, sure. You know, and then you forget, like, oh yeah, there are like shitty people out there to be honest so it's like it is it is something i've had to train myself because i don't inherently think about it but i'm lucky that i have people that like flag it with me and a father that's very protective he used to be a 911 operator because like, you don't know the type of stuff people will do so i was like okay so he's like it's very sweet like he's like serious about it but mm -hmm. yeah it's definitely i'd say like just start with assuming that you have a hundred thousand followers even from zero now from that mindset to like assume that oh could someone figure out like where I live, where I'm going, if I'm not home, all of that stuff from this content. Um, Cause that's what I train myself to do now. And I did it about a hundred thousand people too late. So. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. No problem. Yeah, uh, thank you for sharing your experiences. So uh, what was your challenges for the beginning? For the beginning of producer career or TikTok career? Uh, let's say TikTok. TikTok, um, it's really difficult when your um, entire like content and like being is set on an algorithm. So I've been struggling with that. I've never been somebody that actually cared about the algorithm. Like my followers will still find me, like my community will still be there. But recently the TikTok algorithms changed to a point where people are messaging me being like, why can't I see your content? I'm like, I'm not IT support, I don't know. <laughs> like it's, it, but it's frustrating because inherently like when you, like I now make money off of TikTok. So when I'm quoting brands, it's based off of my understanding of what my rough viewership is. And now if an algorithm changes and my views are going from 40 and 50,000 to like 400, like that's like terrifying. I got mad anxiety and that's like recently. So that's a challenge. Also, um, I used to be someone that never ever, I was very lucky. I didn't struggle with like body dysmorphia or any of that stuff, but inherently, you're staring at yourself every single day and other people are staring at you and it started happening a lot more once people would recognize me in public because I was so afraid I was like oh my god I must look so different or what you like you get so anxious about it and I was never that type of person I cared about it and that like has been a big challenge for me and something I've had to try to overcome just because I'll like ask people like do I look the same and they're like yes you look the same but like your brain like tricks you because like you know your yeah. angles you know like what makes you look good and so I don't want to like pr try to be someone that's like because it happens like you see an influencer in person you're like oh wow like that person looks mm -hmm. nothing with their content because they're photoshopping as they're doing this or that and I don't want to be that person so it's almost like a double-edged sword where I think about it so much that I'm like afraid of coming across that way so and then obviously like People can say whatever they want about you. So that's a thing that's definitely been a challenge. And are you using only TikTok or other social media? Like so YouTube? TikTok was, is my hero platform. Like that's where I post my daily vlogs. Um, and then in, what happened then was people followed me on Instagram because they were interested. So I treat the platforms as TikTok's the hero platform. The people that follow me on Instagram have probably already seen the vlogs or will watch the vlogs. So what I try to do now is give like a different I don't know, taste of my life or different side of the content on like Instagram. So like, I don't cross post. Like some people will post their exact TikToks on Instagram and I go, what's the point of that? I'm not gonna make Sally and Saskatchewan watch the same video twice. That doesn't make any sense. So what I, I use the platforms differently. Um, and then now like with a podcast, that's another stream. So that'll be people who wanna 
get dive into deeper topics. If like we want to um, have a longer discussion that I can't talk about in a one minute or three minute video on TikTok. So I'm starting to branch out more. Um, at one point I wanted to do YouTube, but that just like would literally break me all the editing because I would have to edit myself because I'm crazy and I have a control freak. So um, I think it's, yeah, I'm starting to branch out, but it's also, I don't bite the hand that feeds me. I didn't want to jump into other stuff too quickly and like have to give up the amount of output I was putting on TikTok as well. Thank you. Thank but you. I have a last one. Yeah, uh, of course. Imagine that I have uh, a brand. So can I wish you and ask you to make the promotion to make it viral because you have a lot of people that watching you. And what do you want me to do? You want me to tell you what I would do? Yes. <laughs> okay, so the first thing is if a brand comes to me and says to make it viral, I will say you are not coming to the right gal. It's not me. I've had two viral videos and one of them was of my dogs. And it was very early on, like very, very early on. Um, and then the other one was me surprising Nolan with Leafs tickets. And then I had all these hockey bros commenting, I didn't like it. Um, so what, when I work with brands, what I do is integration. So like, you're not gonna, I really, really try to stay away from like one-off pieces of content and one-off videos. Cause that's like, again, in, unless it's something I'm already using inherently inauthentic mm -hmm. because it's like, oh, she's just here for a paycheck, which I don't want to do. So I, I build out brand packages. So um, you'll see the content or you'll see the brand across multiple platforms. Cause if I'm talking about it on TikTok, I'm probably gonna be talking about it on Instagram, so on and so forth. Um, I also make sure that if I am working with a brand and using a product, I'm using that product for a month before I actually make the video about it. So you guys, if you will notice, if you guys watch the vlogs, you'll probably notice over the last month, like Nivea's cream has been in there. Cause I've been using the Nivea cream for a month before I have an ad coming out with them next week. And so I do that because people notice every little thing when you post every single day. Okay? And if my entire brand is authenticity and sharing what I use in my life, randomly using a new moisturizer, people notice. So I'm not the girl that will get you viral, but I am the girl that has the trust of an audience that I do not take lightly. Mm -hmm. I like hold that like very highly. So, but I will like talk about something and hold it for like a longer period of time. So you'll get like more bang for your buck with me. She has great engagement. If you want her engagement numbers, they're thank you. They're really thank good. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> That's good karma from you. You used to work. In, yeah. In, in influencer PR. <laughs> yeah. Well, you do. You have great engagement. So. <laughs> okay. So, what's your uh, point of view, your perspective in terms of the future of the TV versus social media? I have this debate with work. Okay, so literally at our office, they made the digital unit and the TV unit now sit beside each other because they're like, we're trying to break down the silos because we're all like, it's, it's so funny. And so they like, literally, like, literally, we're sitting beside each other now for that purpose. I'm one of the only people at my job that has worked on both sides. Um, and my studio is supposed to live in this gray space where you can, and you can create high quality television content or digital content in this space. I'm very much of the believer now that People just want good content and it does not matter the platform. Anything that my studio produces is high enough quality that you could put it on television, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Now, does that mean it looks different than the traditional formula of what some of the people have been working at the company for 30 plus years see? Yes, but inherently, and we're still telling the same stories. We might just be doing it in a different way. We're doing it in a shorter way, a more engaging way, a way that allows the audience to interact more instead of us like, because traditional TV has always been like talking at you. Whereas like when we approach digital, we encourage you to come into the conversation. So I think what you're gonna see more of is that more of the digital mindset of allowing the audience to come into the conversation instead of being told, this is what's happening. This is why it's important, blah, blah, blah. Where the audience sits there and goes, well, I might have, I don't know if that is important. Maybe I have an opinion. So you're gonna see more of it. The one thing I hate is when they're like, we're gonna put social on television. And I'm like, what does that mean? Like, no one wants to watch, like, when the news goes, this TikTok went viral. And it's like, <laughs> a tick, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and so I think the mentality changing also, because everything's so instant now. I work in sports. We've had to change our entire Olympic approach due to the fact that it used to be you'd turn on CBC at six o'clock and find out how many medals Canada won. Well, now you follow CBC Olympics, and that's where you find out mm -hmm. how many medals Canada won or you follow this person or the, the athlete themselves has already posted with their medals. So what are we going to bring to the conversation now? So our approach is a lot more context and 
continuing the conversation about the news as opposed to just telling it to you on television because by the time it's on television because it takes a long time to make television you've already seen it so i think they're gonna have to start taking more digital approaches but and just changing the way that we've seen television as just news and talking at you if that answers your question um to add to that how are you bringing people into the conversation like what tools are you using um to create engagement with your audiences on television mm, mm. digital okay digital yeah. is easier because they're not doing it very well on television yeah, right digital. now <laughs> well it's hard it's hard yeah it's it hard is. it's hard given the demographics of like where i work it's it's difficult mm. um a lot of just like again we don't want to like tell people what the news is because they know the news um we don't want to tell somebody that like this person won a medal you want to um tell them something they don't know or bring the conversation mm -hmm. further because i also see watch times important and like longer form storytelling so we do a lot we do a series called in conversation with where the whole point is we take a big news topic and get three different perspectives on it and then mm -hmm. bring them all in one space maybe three different perspectives of the journalist an athlete and a coach who you otherwise wouldn't have all seen on your timeline so that's one way but then cool. On the TikTok side, it's just like always like engagement tools of like asking a question or encouraging people. Like my a recent thing that kind of popped off was I was debating on watching Gilmore Girls for the first time or One Tree Hill, not One Tree Hill. Well, that was one of the options or The OC. I'd never seen either of them, okay. and like that that video got Please four. Tell me you went with Gilmore Girls. Yes, I did. Okay, good. That video got <laughs> four. Okay, it had like four thousand comments. 4,000 comments. Wow. I was like, pardon? Like that many people are this passionate about it? And then I couldn't even tell which had the most votes. But like, that's another thing is like engaging people with like, that's an aspect of my life is I'm sitting there going, what show do I want to watch? Well, why not ask TikTok? Mm. And then it's my most highly engaged video I've had this month. And it's just like things like that as a, a question that you'd ask yourself, I go, why not ask the internet for their mm. opinion? And people love giving their opinion. And they're very they passionate do. about Gilmore Girls. Very, it's <laughs> yes. a fall show, Sarah. Yeah. It's cozy vibes. That's why I got yelled at. <laughs> it's cozy people, vibes. People are like, what show did you pick? I'm like, watch the vlogs, guys. I'm watching Gilmore Girls. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, for the first time ever. Wow. I knew no context about it either. They're both named Lorelai. I had no idea. <laughs> Melissa McCarthy, isn't it? No yeah, idea. I'm, yeah, I can't believe this is your first time. Yeah, I know. Wow. I'm an older sister. It's like a little ahead of my generation. Okay, so yeah, yeah. I didn't have any older siblings to watch it with. Mm, to push it on you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The internet pushed it on me instead. <laughs> yeah. Do we have any other questions from the audience? I just whacked my knee. <laughs> I apologize. It's I'm the like, hand oh, talker in you. I know, it's so bad. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm so glad that you're here. I've, like Thank this you. has been really um, interesting to listen to. Um, so my question is, obviously you're a creator, but what is the kind of digital media that you like to consume? Like, who are you following? What inspires you? Like, do you have your top favorite influencers? Yes, that is a great question. I was thinking the same, I was like, that's such a good question. <laughs> Mine um, are OG YouTube days. So I mm. still am just obsessed with my same OG YouTubers. My girl, Claudia Saluski, who transitioned from YouTube and then started dating Phineas before he was a famous singer. It's Billy Eilish's brother, anyways. Um, oh. uh, like insane. And now he's like super famous as well. Girl, like, like talk about an early investment. Perfect. I'm obsessed <laughs> with her. Um, and now she's an actress. Now she's like acting, which is so cool. I love her. I love her fashion sense. Um, I'm a big like celebrity gossip girl. So it will do moi on Instagram with all the tea and all the blind items. Do you guys know about this? Oh my God, no. I tell everyone at work, I never shut up about it. All this stuff, but don't worry, darling. I've known about it for months. I've been like holding on to it because do moi on the oh blind items. <laughs> it's basically like people submit anonymous things to celebrities. They have Sunday okay. spotted where like on their Instagram story, they'll go through and just like, you people just go spotted at Soho House, West Hollywood, Ooh, Chris Pine. It's so just you're getting like all that. the tea before. Yeah, uh, I love, I okay. love it. And I know it's, probably, fun. it's so fun again, hypocritical. Cause if someone like did that to me, I'd be like, what the heck? But <laughs> it's so much fun to watch. Like I submitted a Dumois someday spotted when I was at stagecoach. I saw Taylor Lautner and I felt famous. I was like, Dumois reposted me. Did, you, was, did they? Yeah, yeah, they did. And they're anonymous. They're the real life gossip girl. Oh, full circle. Goodness. They're the real life gossip girl. Okay, Anyways. I loved gossip girls. So anyway, to check this out. Um, <laughs> they're not really an influencer, but I guess they count. Um, and then Tess Christine, someone I've followed forever. She's a YouTuber and now she's like a mom. So it's been really cool to watch her transition from like 
um, just being like an it fashion girl living in New York to now like being a new mom and just yeah I'm I'm also I love the try guys which like is so mm -hmm. like lame of me but like who does I, it I love them Keith eats the menu is the most genius piece of content <laughs> I've ever seen in my life it's one of those shows where as a producer I look and I go why did I not think of that like how would I do that with sports I couldn't but like eats the menu it's so genius the watch time the engagement so those are probably just a couple of mine I'm also just really bad for not knowing people's names. I just scroll through TikTok and know them as, again, me talking about not wanting to be the girl that like does one thing. And like, I do that to other people. I just know people based on the, one the thing. thing they do. Yeah, yeah, it's like the mommy YouTubers, the yeah. lifestyle yeah, YouTubers. I know. <laughs> I, yeah, a hundred percent. Like same with TikTok. I just like scroll and scroll and scroll. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. That's all of the time we have for questions today. I really appreciate you all joining us here. It's been awesome having Sarah. Thank you. I don't know if there's, you have any last words. No, no, just let me know about the food at the Ottawa airport. Is there anything I can eat there? <laughs> <laughs> um, Everyone laughed and I'm like, Haha, that's funny. I feel like the Montreal airport, the food's better there because there's the Saint Hubert. I think at the Montreal oh, airport interesting. and that one's it's real good so interesting. <laughs> unfortunately Ottawa, I'm not in Montreal yeah so. the Ottawa one I feel like there's just a Tim Hortons in a subway like oh. I don't think there's anything else unfortunately oh. yeah okay. well let me know if the food at Algonquin College is good <laughs> it is okay we all stop here it's really good go to the marketplace food court wow Fancy. this is an ad for the marketplace food court I have everyone my go there after this I have my backpack so I feel like I'm gonna look like a student just like yeah back at it I can go with you I forgot my name tag so I'll so we'll also look, look like, like a student students. okay perfect <laughs> perfect sounds good thank you for having me thank you for showing up I was afraid no one was gonna show up because my imposter syndrome but thank you for having me yeah. um and I hope it was interesting <laughs> <laughs> me being like you were interesting <laughs> you're so easy <laughs> like uh. I love um that yeah so thank you to everyone who joined us in person today at the AC Hub. This was also recorded, so it will be available online. Um, and thank you for joining us to kick off the fifth season of Third Thursdays back in person, which Ooh. is awesome. <laughs> um, and yeah, have a great Thursday. I hope thank it's you. thirsty and third. Oh, I like that. I like that. <laughs>